I'm going to talk to you this evening about a building that we finished in January this year. It's a nine-story building, and it's in constructed. Constructed. <laughs> got lazy. So it's not contrived entirely from timber. Um, this is my office. This is uh, uh, our office. Uh, this is War Thistleton. This is the cafe opposite my office. This is in fact. Um, this is me here, and me here, and me here, <laughs> and me over there. We're a very small office, right? <laughs> and we always try and make ourselves look a little bit bigger. This is, this is uh, that's my daughter, and uh, that's actually a, she's a waitress. <laughs> so that's that's our Christmas card from a couple of years ago. We are in fact about um, we we sort of vary between about fourteen and, and twenty people. And uh, we've been going 12 years, came straight out of school and uh, started the office. The work that we've been doing as a practice, we do lots of different work. We, you know, we started straight from school, so most of the work we did at the beginning was bars and restaurants and loft apartments and everything. But underpinning that kind of work has always been an interest in the environmental effects of, of architecture, not just in terms of the effect, the, the amount of energy that our buildings use, through you know through the kind of like correct orientation, through insulation, through all the things that we all need to do, we all know we need to do, but also through the construction materials that we use and the impact of those construction materials. So looking, this is I plucked this off websites. So concrete production accounts for between seven and ten percent of global carbon dioxide emissions. The concrete lobbying organisations say seven percent, and uh, Greenpeace say ten percent. <laughs> so I'm not going to make a judgment, it's between 7 and 10% of global emissions. I do know, however, that it's widely accepted that airline travel is 1.6% of global emissions. So then we can see immediately the kind of effect that production of concrete has with regard to, to um, its reliance on fossil fuels for its production. This is, a, this is the beach in England, so this is a warning <laughs> to anybody who hasn't been to England not to go. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, <clears throat> well, at least don't go to the seaside. <laughs> Um, we don't swim. And this is, uh, this is part of our uh, ever decreasing coast line. That's a, a tree. Um, this is cross laminated timber. Cross laminated timber is like a jumbo plywood. It's made um, from uh, planks of timber that are about 25 mil thick by about 75 mil wide. Any lengths down to about a metre long. And it's finger jointed together, laid out, and then cross laminated at 90 degrees. <coughs> Sprayed with a PUR adhesive which is solvent-free and formaldehyde-free. Well, at least these people do. I'm going to tell you about why we work with this company particularly um, in, in a bit. But if, so the cross laminated timber acts as this jumbo plywood. It goes through the factory um, here. It goes to the factory in panels that are about 16 metres long and about 3 metres wide. They always tell me exactly how long and how wide, but we always slightly forget. It's about 16 metres by about 3 metres. We can go in the UK uh, of 12.8 meters, because that's as big as it can get through the channel tunnel. But this is, <laughs> this, <clears throat> so this is in fact, this is where it's, it comes out here, comes out of these big long slabs, and it goes into a CNC router, <coughs> a uh, numerically controlled router, and they cut the panels out, they cut all the windows out, and the doors out, and if you're really smart, and you ask them nicely, they'll route in all the cable channels. For the timber. So then, so this is your this is your kind of like your flat pack assembled building is, is lying here in the factory. So one cubic meter of timber stores 0.8 tons of carbon. So this is a, this is this is an important part of what we're looking at. So no matter we're not using concrete that produces that relies on these fossil fuels to produce it and has these massive amounts of emissions, but we're also in fact sequestering carbon within the body, within the body of the tree itself within the body of the lumber, and then we're locking that, we're building that, and then we're planting more trees, we not, they are. They're planting more trees, and therefore soaking up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, releasing more oxygen, and giving everybody more rain. So this is our site that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. This is, um, this is where I live and work, <laughs> and it looks so <laughs> attractive compared to outside of here. This is, uh, this is the east end of London. This is um, everything you've ever seen in any kind of Guy Ritchie movie or the EastEnders or anything like that. And it's, uh, it's nasty. This is Jack Beard's Castle, which was a pub and where they planned one too many bank robberies and they closed the pub down. And this is our site here. I'm not sure what they've done in colour, but anyway, this is our site here. Um, the surrounding area is uh, predominantly social housing, 1950s concrete frame, brick clad social housing. Um, the whole area was cleared um, compliments of the Germans in the late 40s, mid 40s, and so then we uh, rebuilt uh, 10 years later 
this large amounts of social housing. Bizarrely, however, down this street here, about two kilometres down this street here, is St Paul's Cathedral and the whole entire sort of financial district of London. So the land values around here are very high. So we have a situation where the local government is selling off these little sites all over the place to private developers. Private developers pay the local government, and then the local government uses the money to refurbish the adjacent buildings. This is the idea. So the developer buys this plot of land and makes planning application, and the people that sold him the land in the first place deny him planning consent. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just love that. So they then deny him planning consent again. And then they came to us, and they thought, okay, Damn, I will have to do something creative. So they came to us, which is quite cool. So they came to us, and but through these two failed planning applications, <coughs> the volume of the the volume of the building was established, and we knew that we could get pretty much a site extrusion. So that's our site there, 17 and a half meters by 17 and a half meters, and then we could extrude that to nine to, to nine stories. You can see here really, the adjacency of these buildings here to the side. So this is eight meters here to the side. So this material, we found this material, we have students in the office, like every architecture practice, we get the students to come in and they give us new iTunes and, <laughs> and we give them really boring work and, some kind of, and, and every day they come. But we also are very keen on using the students in the office to inform us about what's going on and to really invigorate the office in terms of kind of new things going on. And we had a student in the office who was moaning me for ages to come and see this alternative technology centre in the south of London. So eventually I went down there, went and had a look, went to this yurt, it was sitting in the kind of in South London, and there was predictable sheep's wool insulation and hemp creek and all the other stuff that you get. And then in the corner was this Austrian guy selling this jumbo plywood. And at the time we had a project which was a 17th century um, historic building, and uh, we had got planning consent to build a three-story building in the yard, completely landlocked site in the yard. And of course, <laughs> you know, we're, we're at that architectural stage where we take any commission pretty much <laughs> and you know, get planned consent and then we'll wonder how the heck we're going to build it afterwards. So it had been bothering me for some time, <laughs> usually late at night, about how we were going to get the materials through this historic building into the yard and build a three story building. And then I saw this stuff and I thought, we well, you know we can prefabricate it and we can drop it in with a crane over the top. And about three months later, I sat on a Saturday <clears> afternoon with my daughter and we watched these guys crane in and assemble a three-story building on a Saturday afternoon. And it was sort of epiphanous. Anyway, it was kind of like, I thought, I'm sold on this, and I really want to work with this. So every time a developer, a client, came through the office for the next five years or so, I'd sit them down and say, well, we're working with this amazing new building. <coughs> Have you considered doing your building with this amazing new material? And our argument for this new material became honed, if you like. It became clearer and clearer about how we were going to get our building built with this building. And in this situation, lots of different things conspired to help us. There was a shortage of rebar, concrete was expensive because of the Beijing Olympics. So there was lots of stuff going on like that that actually made this client sit down and listen to us. I should go back one actually. And say that what happens is the Housing Association, we have a we have the way in which we supply social housing is through not-for-profit organizations called housing associations, they then um, they then employ architects and then they, they sell off to a house builder, the house builder builds it and they give back the social housing. So usually what happens is when we get a job from a housing association, often do myself down, often what happens is we get a job from a housing association, the developer comes on, the developer takes one look at us and goes, well, I mean, I'm gonna employ another architect, thank you for the design. And that's it. It's like a, so it's a bit of a rodeo, you know, and you get the kind of like so your developer comes in, the house builder comes in, matching shirt and tie. And, uh, <laughs> and then we had to sit through and, and, and work the whole thing out. So we had our argument. So we, we discussed this. So the house builder came in, and to their credit, they were open minded. They saw that there was a problematic time you know, to build at the time there was a bit of a house going on, so they wanted to get this product, they wanted to get their apartments built and finished and sold, etc. 